Travelers, and welcome to another episode of the Diversity Stars Podcast third season. How my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. This is an amazing episode because Julian Richings boards the mothership. You know him as Death on Supernatural. Now come on board as we go traversing the stars. Hi, Mr. Richings. Thank you so much for coming to Diversity Stars Podcast. Well, thank you very much. Good to be here. It's an absolute honor to speak with you, sir. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of yours. My wife is a huge fan of yours. My father's a huge fan of yours. Oh. So well, thank you so much for doing this for me. Okay, well, it's all in the family. That's amazing. It 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 is because you play. I, I I think every role you're in, you're just fantastic in it, and that's like from Umbrella Academy. You're great as well. Supernatural, um, X Men Last Stand. I mean, everything you're in, you're good in it, and I think that's just a matter. So no matter what audience you're drawing from, right? They like you. So <laughs> good job. Well, that's good. Uh, it's it's actually uh, it's a part of what I I think is my job. You know, I I feel that I. I bring a primary color to shows and I'm not necessarily the lead narrative, you know, like the person that you follow from beginning to end on a heroic journey. But I do tend to come into things and knock it sideways or give it an extra dimension. And then that's my job to basically do that to the best of my, my ability. And the beauty of that is that, you, you know, I can really turn up the volume and I can go for it and I can create something that's quite memorable um that because i know it's going to be short and uh effective yeah I, I do find that everything you're in you even if you're only on for a short time you you have that spark where you, the audience immediately just is drawn to your character and is just fascinated by what you're doing with that character <laughs> well it's probably to do with cheekbones uh, a big <laughs> nose and an english accent i i don't know <laughs> uh, you know it's just one of those things i I have a very specific face, which is both a, a blessing and a curse. It means that, you know, people will look at me in a very particular way. And sometimes I go, oh, why can't I be that, that heroic guy that rescues the, the woman at the end and they ride off into the sunset, you know, that, but that's, that's not my, uh, my bag. And uh, I'm sort of comfortable in being more of a um, kind of character outsider um, not your regular guy. So it, it's fine. And, and therefore I fit into a lot of genre, which tends to be the underbelly of um, suburban life. It tends to be that, that not your pretty American dream. So I, I seem to embody that. It, I mean, and it's kind of funny that in so many roles, you are kind of sort of the villain in many of them, or at least you're the one that people wonder is there something sinister <laughs> going on with this character? Because as you get into like a character like Death, it's hard to say Death is a villain because he's not. He's a force of nature. Yeah. However, there's something still inherently intimidating and sinister about him. And when we get to um, he um, Hexenberger, same thing. There's something about the characters you play that just is inherently intimidating. Well, it's, it, there's a darkness or a menace to them. Um, and I, I find that a really interesting thing to play. Um, and... If you're set up correctly, it means that you can actually play all the other colors, too. So, for instance, in Supernatural, with that amazing uh, opening sequence, um, it's it's set up so beautifully with the combination of this, the music and the slow-mo and everything that's going on, is that we've established that I am a very powerful being. Mm. You do not mess with me. So that it's given me that gift that to go into the next scene, an intimate scene with uh, Dean, you know, with Jensen Ackles. So um, I, I don't have to play intimidating. I don't have to play, I'm tough. You know, I can just enjoy it and relish the colors and the textures of the pizza and, and stuff. Mm. So it actually makes it makes my character more memorable. So, so yeah, and there are times when you will see that I'm probably working harder than I need to be, you know, but in the right circumstances, um, I, I relish it and I, I have fun. You know, that's such a great description of what death is like as a character on Supernatural is that it was almost effort, effortlessly. Intimidating. Yeah. And it, and yeah. it was, you know, very much so, and 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 I think there's another thing too where 
he also represents a life cycle. I, I think the very fact that he has such a great relationship with Dean, particularly the two boys, but particularly Dean, he becomes a sort of um, a stern uncle that actually really likes his nephew and he likes to flick his ear from time to time. But he actually likes the idea that he he does all these weird things. He likes these foods. He, he finds them fascinating. So here you've got this... Um, force that loves the minutiae of de of life but he's actually coming to take people to their grave but almost in a um, sort of a, a kind recognition that it's the end of a cycle rather mm. than i'm picking on you it's your turn it's like no he's trying to make it as gentle as he can well i wouldn't say gentle but he's he, it's it's um, not personal it's just he's doing his job and and as well as he can there i think as you mentioned that opening when you were con uh, conceiving of your performance for death, right? Yeah. Did you already have that moment in mind? Was there another moment of the character where you thought, I get him now. Now I understand who he is. No, you know, it, it never really happens like that, particularly when you're a character actor like myself. I mean, I've done like hundreds of shows where I'll parachute in and I'll do a series. And to be honest with you, there, there are times when I'm kind of going, what is this show? Who is this? Like, what's going on? And I have to kind of figure it out on the ground. Now, um, I went into Supernatural pretty blind. I didn't, I, I had an idea of the show. It was already well established. Um, and I had an idea of the dynamic between the brothers. And um, so I wasn't completely ignorant, but uh, I kind of felt my way into the part and I, all I could do was use the clues that was in the script that they're given me, which was he loves pizza, he relishes it and he enjoys um, giving Dean shit as well. You know, he's he's it, it's sort of all part of his game and he likes a little bit of um, playing cat and mouse. Right. So I just took that and ran with it. And then the writers realized that it was a good combination of things and then mm. they started to write for me and for that kind of thing and then they started to go wouldn't it be great if we got another set of food <laughs> and another you know another weird place that dean can meet death and they can have a discussion and stuff so it sort of grew from there so it's a really cool organic process and uh, the writers have to take credit for that, really. They gave me the clues, and I just went in. And like I said earlier, I, I gave it 100%. I figured, okay, well, go for it. You know, uh, just take take liberties and go with your instinct. I, I think so much of that performance was, there was, a, there was a subtle genius to it all, I think. Um, and I don't think I'm being hyperbolic. I think it really was the subtle genius in how you did it. Because on the one hand, when you're creating death, you can't help but being a person. You're a person. But death is so far beyond the human experience that it's virtually as aliens are going to get to us. So yeah. I think when you gave the performance, you gave some of that. Even how you're eating the pizza on someone feels not <laughs> quite like it's like he's almost experiencing it for the first time, like eating. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's another dimension to it, too, which is what I was saying to you earlier about, you know, the kind of roles that I find that I'm both given and attracted to and that tends to be people that are a little bit outside a little bit old school maybe a little bit formal because of my age because of my background so there's a sort of a sense of me channeling the old world in death too so that he doesn't quite fit in contemporary chicago but he kind of likes it and enjoys it and is a bit of a um, an outsider um, and and so as a result of that, I, I, a few people have asked me about this and I realized that I, I've channeled a, a few of my childhood influences um, from Hammer Horror. Like, you know, I would watch uh, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee uh, uh, in performances that were very much steeped in a theatrical tradition. Mm. And whereas I haven't impersonated those guys, I realize I carry that legacy. Um, and and I think that's part of the success of the role. And and I, I think that one of the cool things too is that as you mentioned, the more he shows up, you kind of he feels like he softens a little bit. He gets there's a little bit of a softening to him. Um, and but there's still that sense of beyond being beyond anything happening in our little human lives. You know, he's so well beyond us, but he feels like he there's like a softening, like a um, like. 
like you said, a, a little bit of compassion now starting to like seep in, but he still is yeah. like, I'm still so far above anything that you can possibly imagine that this is still yeah. kind of um, a waste for me to be involved in any of this. Yeah, he's still grumpy Uncle Death, right? <laughs> he, uh, uh, yeah. So w when you're um, conceiving that scene with Jensen Ackles at, at the uh, the pizza bar, which is this to me the one of the two best scenes that you have. The other one is with um, Castiel in season seven when he's like the guy Castiel. So you were working with Jensen Ackles. What what was the conversation like about how you were going to perform it? Um, and what because I know that you know there's the scary part. It's also funny as well. There's humor there. How did you right. make sure to ride that balance? Um, I'm very thankful that Jensen is such a pro and, and a good actor. I mean, you know, there's a lot of leads on shows that are charismatic and they're great, but they're not necessarily really fine actors. Jensen's a great actor and he's the kind of person that can enhance the guest's performance. And that um, both him and Jared have done that continually throughout the show. And I think that's the reason for its longevity actually is that everybody kind of shines along the show and and you know that there you go oh, i love that guy i love that woman there and that's amazing uh but it's because they allow other people in and they make them look good mm. so for instance that that scene in the pizza parlor i knew i was onto a good thing i mean i'd never met jensen before right and we were we were there rehearsing and he was really playing being scared of me and I, it wasn't like I had to muscle my way through the scene he was like genuinely kind of like like this and I thought this is fantastic what a gift for me I can just kind of enjoy being there watching him being scared hmm. and that uh, I think we built it from there really the the only funny um sort of uh, tip I I got from him was <laughs> Uh, as, as somebody that had been on the show a lot and had consumed a lot of food on the show, as we were rehearsing, he was looking at me and going, you're eating a lot of pizza there, man. Like, <laughs> I, I, would, I would slow down on the pizza if I were you. Uh, because, you know, I was kind of nervous and I was hungry, actually. I'd already shot the opening montage scene and I hadn't eaten. And they, uh, we, we were rehearsing with this delicious deep dish Chicago pizza. And actually in the rehearsal, I was eating it, you know, and I was and he was saying, don't don't cut, you know, um, paint yourself into a corner with having to eat in every mouthful, you know, every, everything you say. And he was quite right, too. And you'll notice that he actually uh, I think that I think there's one moment when he actually picks up the piece of pizza and uh, sort of tastes it and then puts it back down again and makes a very good actor choice. But it's also a good survival choice of a guy that's been around and knows not to get stuck eating or, you know, take 33, still eating that pizza. So, <laughs> so that was real Chicago pizza you were having right there? It was. Uh, it, the, um, the props folk were, were really proud of the fact that they managed to get somebody that did an original deep dish pizza, even though it was in Vancouver. It was somebody that had come from Chicago and had an authentic recipe. So, uh, so yeah, it was really good too. And I was hungry. <laughs> it does look delicious. I'm watching you eat, and I'm like, oh, every time I watch that scene, I just I get a little hungry for some pizza. I've never had Chicago pizza before, and I <laughs> it makes it look real good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the, like I said, the other favorite scene that um, you have, I think, in the series is, like I said, the Cassio death scene. Yeah, you know, when when you're um, talking, um, confronting Cassio, who believes he's got at that point, but he's falling apart and all that other stuff. So, what was that scene like? Because that was, I think, the first. That's the second time you returned after that um, original yeah. appearance. Yeah. Um, at what point? Um, what was that like? What was it? Um, did you start feeling more comfortable in like in the show itself as a re recurring character now? Yeah, I did. I, I started. To, I was starting to sort of relax into it and go, "Oh, I see. There's there's more to this world, and I've got a part in this world." Um, but it was a new thing because I'd never met Castiel before. I'd never met Misha as an actor, right? Yeah. So here was another guy coming at me, and he also has a very he's he's a good actor and a very generous. Uh, he was. Um, he hadn't been on the show for so long at that point. So he was kind of newer and had a newer energy to things. Um, so we, you know, we, we were sort of, as one does, you, you naturally feel each other out in terms of what, what 
they they bring to the table. And I I really got on well with him. Um, but it was it it was a bit of a curveball for me. So because not only did I have the dynamic of the boys, but then then I had Misha too. Um, mm. So I was trying to figure out. You know, it was more of a three way thing. Um, but what was interesting about that scene um, was that it was quite technically difficult because we had lots of effects going on, sh- room shaking. We were setting up. It was the final, um, as far as I remember, it's the final as, um, show, episode of the season. We're setting up the following season, I think. And I, I, Supernatural fans will hate me because I've suddenly gone blank and I don't know as much. My 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 uh, knowledge is is pitiful compared to supernatural fan base. But but um, anyway, uh, it was quite a complex scene, and um, so I was really sort of I had my blinkers on and I was trying to figure out. Okay, so the lights are going to go and this is going to flash and stuff's going to fall. So there was a lot of focus on set, and and I actually found that with all the episodes that I shot, every single one in the series um, was very focused. Uh, a lot of people at conventions will say, hey, what about being pranked by uh, Jared and Jensen? And I can honestly say, no, they never pranked me. I, I always say, well, it's because they were too scared of me. <laughs> but uh, it's, that's not actually the truth. The truth of the matter is that all of our scenes were highly technical. Mm. And, um, you know, whether it's special effects with rooms falling around, lights shimmering and stuff like that, or eating food. Eating food is actually quite a a difficult thing to orchestrate within a scene, you know, uh, continuity, making sure that the the food has been eaten the right amount for take 33 as it is in take two. You know what I mean? Like, like it's, 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 so there was a lot of focus on all those scenes. So, my overriding impression of, of the show is one of kind of it's fun, but it, it was always focused and that, uh, you know, uh, we got on with it. We did long days work and, and it was fun. I, 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 yeah, I had a good time. I, I think the, the other thing that's kind of interesting about um, that, that scene that's a little different than your other scenes is that previously in the, your two previous appearances up to that point, you're dealing with the boys who yeah. are obviously, from a, uh, um, a standpoint of power, re- really insignificant compared to death. Right. Nisha, as Castiel at that moment, is sort of godlike in his power. So it's a, yeah. that's a different dynamic for you as death to play off of. Yeah. So how it's a standoff. Think, right. So Sorry. how do you think about how death now is going to approach a character who now is potentially close to his equal? Yeah, yeah, and and that was the challenge of that. That as it was um, rather than cat and mouse, it was a standoff of um, almost equals. I like to think of myself as being more powerful, mm. although I, I don't think that my my um, track record actually proves <laughs> it. With what happens to me, but um, anyway, uh, I yeah, it, and so that was an interesting thing, and. Um, it, it was it, it was fun to have Misha coming at me with that energy. And it meant that I had to make a decision of, okay, do I try and match it or do I kind of deflect it and and turn around and not be very intimidated by it at all and just being very relaxed. And in fact, Misha encouraged me on my journey to kind of go, okay, this guy's challenging me. I'm not going to bite back. I'm going to just go, sure, it doesn't worry me. You know, and to, to continue with that, sense of being relaxed and nonchalant about things and that helped me evolve the character of death more i think mm. excuse me while i just said uh, i'm we're in a funny place right now um here i'm i'm talking to you from toronto and we, we're sort of in spring and it goes from being really cold to really hot so as we're talking i'm getting very hot here so i'm going to do a strip tease for your viewers <laughs> No worries. It will just bring up the viewer, the, the viewer count, right? Yeah, that's right. I right? just meant make sure that I look beautiful and I put my glasses on so I can see. There we go. All right. So now, now flash up, uh, fast forwarding. Um, obviously you had the Castiel scene. You had a few other scenes in between. Eventually, we get to the death of death, uh, which, yeah. as a fan, was one of the least liked moments on the show because you were such a great version of death. Uh, while I did understand why they did it later on, because obviously. You can't have death around if you're going to try to kill God. That kind of death could do it on his own. Um, yeah. I get that. But 
when you thought about that scene, did you think to yourself what could have been with the character? Like, did you were there other areas you wanted th that road to go down instead? Uh, I've learned not to do that. You know, in life, like it, 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 to survive as an actor, it's like a gigging musician or something. You kind of go, nah, okay. If only I'd have been on David Bowie's album. That, that like, no, 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 no. You 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 can't do that. You just have to go, okay. The beauty of what happened was that it kept it very fresh. Uh, it kept it very pure. And a lot of people really liked it. And the way that they transformed the whole notion of death, I thought was really cool too. It, it was certainly a surprise for uh, the fan base, for me as well. But also it challenged our assumptions of how do you represent death? Like, how, like what is death? So I thought it was a very cool notion. And I had to focus on the positive side of it rather than the negative. In, in, my, in my business, I don't, you know, once you start going down the road of, oh, coulda, shoulda, woulda, oh, it's too bad, they, oh, they don't like me, um, it, it, you can't do that. You just have to go, okay. And I know it wasn't because they hated me. Like, I knew it was a creative choice. I mean, I'd, I'd have felt more in, awkward or embarrassed if they if I got fired, you know, or if there was a standoff with somebody. But no, it, it wasn't that. It was um, a creative choice. And uh, creative choices are important and amazing that, again, I, that a show that's been going that long can do that and mm -hmm. take risks with uh, characters that are established and popular. And again, I think that's why the show overall has maintained, or well, did maintain for so long. So, like I said, you you had been on from season five. I can't remember the exact season that your character got killed, but you, you've been, you're on, you had a lot of different appearances. Yeah, five so, to uh, ten. Which seasons, was, five, seasons five to ten. Five through ten. Uh, once yeah. again, there probably will be some comments like, it's ten, goddammit. Uh, <laughs> right, it wasn't sure of the year, but, um, but, being that you've been on you know, and as a recurring character, you're part of that supernatural family now. You're part of that like small group of supernatural actors and characters that have really been uh, people have been attached to for a while now. Right. So, what has it been like to be part of that supernatural family? It's I. It's made a huge difference in my life uh, for the last I would say five to seven eight years i've started to adjust to the notion of conventions being like fan conventions i i you know i grew up in the 60s i i knew star trek was kind of a distant idea and i knew there were trekkies and i knew there were there were vehicles for fans if they were genre fans that, that you know you could sort of get your geek on in certain contexts but the evolution of the fan convention has been an amazing thing and the recognition that with a show like Supernatural, the fan base is critical to the show. There's a sort of um, a back and forth relationship with um, the the actors, the show itself, the, the mythology of the show and the people that watch it and feel part of the Supernatural family. It's been an amazing um, an experience for me. I've I've become quite used to going to conventions. At first I thought, I felt a little bit cheesy. I thought, wow, well, how can I go and talk about something that I've already done? I'm onto my next role as an actor now, but I've realized how creative that is to actually, mm. to be in pockets of fan interest and to sort of have discussions and to, to talk to people. And um, particularly with the supernatural actors, We've done enough now together that we all know each other and like each other. And we are sort of extensions of our of the personalities that we've portrayed within the show, too. So so it's it's been really good. Um, and I've enjoyed going to different places and meeting people. And I like I like the whole idea of accountability. I like an accessibility of, of performers. Mm. Now, you know, I'm not Brad Pitt. I'm not like a guy that you walk down the street and will get completely bothered and mobbed and, uh, and sworn for pictures and stuff. I'm not that guy. Um, but I am recognizable and I, I actually really enjoy that interaction and that accountability and the fact that 
there is a forum where fans can go and they can honestly talk to you. you they can sit around a table or they, they can sit in, in a Q&A, um, a panel, and, and ask you honest questions and you can give honest answers back. I, I think it's fantastic. Um, and it's, it's something that I never dreamt would, would happen. Um, you know, we, we all, I watched Galaxy Quest, you know, many years ago, which sort of satirized the whole Comic-Con thing. And, uh, you know, there, there was um, Alan Rickman doing a great job of the traditional Shakespearean actor going, "Could I played Hamlet once. I'm not doing this rubbish, you know. Um, but I, And so that kind of mythology has been dispelled. And uh, I really like them. Now, I guess the real question, have you ever been walking down the street and someone bumped into you, just like in the uh, your opening introduction, and, <laughs> and recognized you after? Well, I do get lots of, hey, death, how's it going? You know, and stuff like that. <laughs> um, it's it's funny how uh, the, the name death sort of is, is um, pe people think of it affectionately. So uh, people will often yell it at me. Um, and, and, and I have to explain sometimes to people who have no idea what supernatural is. So it's, it's good. It's all good. These are good people. It's fun. Uh, so yeah. Uh, anyway, like I said, you're, um, there's so many fans of yours, and I think that's fantastic. And it, it, I think it's surprising that Supernatural has been on off now for has it been three years now? Maybe three years. I, I think, I think it has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people still have that same passion for the series as they did when it was you know, on air, and that's a rare occurrence. I mean, you have a few like your Star Trek, me Firefly, a couple of others. Um, but yeah. to have something that's off there and people are still clamoring for more is a hell of a thing. Yeah, it really is. I, I'm so um, I'm so privileged to be a part of it. You know, um, now it's it's funny. A guy like me too. It only represents a tiny piece of my career. So it's uh, th there are times when I feel a little guilty uh, because I, I obviously like Supernatural and I have no problem in celebrating it and pushing it um, and, and discussing it with the fan base. But there are other projects that I do sometimes and I go, wow, if only you, you had some of the exposure that I've had with Supernatural, it, mm -hmm. you know, other people deserve it too. So, that, you know, anyway, that's the oh. way it goes. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's interesting to see which ones people latch on to. Like, for for instance, as we're, we're going to go on, um, you play Mr. Hexenmeister in the sequel to Wickensburg called Return to Wickensburg, yeah. uh, which is kind of like a family horror um, yeah. movie. And it kind of insinuates sort of, but not towards the end, that you are also death on, on some level. They, they kind of play with that idea. I, I mean, it's definitely me doing my... Um... Uh, my turn, my my dark turn, and and there's and and I think that I, I I would say that they're very different characters, but they certainly have elements of humor, of um uh, of um self deprecation almost, if if that makes sense. Like they they don't take themselves too seriously, in a way, and yet they do, and yet they're very vain. So there's there's there's. And I think some of that comes back to my training. I trained in physical theater. I, I uh, embody sort of a large, like I, I go back to Commedia dell'arte in, in Italy and, and some of the traditional theater forms that have large physical presences that tend to be um, kind of um, a little larger than naturalistic life mm. and therefore you only have to dial it slightly differently and it can be very appropriate for a younger audience. And I think that's where um, the Hexenmeister is going. It's, and, and that whole series is going for a very, very different market. And I will say though, and he's also extremely stylish. That's, that's a cool, uh, right. the way they begin. Like, that's cool. I was like, I want a hat like that. <laughs> that yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those those were funny. They just came together very very quickly. We went, oh yeah, that's fun and that's fun, and then we just went for it. Yeah. So so when you're playing a character like um like um Hexenberg in uh, Return to Wickensburg or the original Wickensburg, because it's a family film, you're playing though this horror. You're definitely playing a scary guy. Like how much you want to dial it up or down based on the genre or the age group you're working within now. I, I, I okay. So one of the things is I think it's very important never to pa patronize your audience. Like never play down to a kid. 
and kind of go, oh, well, I'm going to be, you know, uh, because kids see through that. And I think you have to, if anything, you dial it up, but you allow the context of the story to kind of present you in maybe a slightly different way so that all the stuff around you doesn't make you so terrifying or it makes you scary in, in a more contemplative way or a more accessible way for kids without terrorizing them. Um, so it's more like, um, uh, like a, a, a fairy tale, which are very scary, like real fairy tales and, oh, and yeah. the, the nurse crimes. Like, oh, oh yeah. goodness me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I always go back to one of my favorite movies ever uh, that influenced me as a kid. I, I, 1955, Night of the Hunter, black and white movie directed by Charles Lawton. Um, and it has two kids on the run from a fake priest played by Robert Mitchum with the tattoos love and hate on his knuckles. And he's after the money that is in the little kid's teddy bear. And he's um, he, and they don't know why he's chasing them, but they're terrified of him. And it's black and white. And it's it's terrifying, mm. but it's terrifying for kids. It's terrifying for adults. It's about vulnerability. It's a you know it it strikes all these chords. Uh, and uh, for me, if I'm playing a character, I'll go for it. But I'm I rely on the people around me. The lighting, the lighting in um, Wicken Wickensburg is very different than Supernatural. Mm. The the budget, the you know, or the, the everything about it, uh, the music. Um, it's we're dealing with a very very di a, a different story, a very different style of story. But I have to also go for it. I, I can't just sort of go, well, I'll give it 50% on the horror here. I just, I, I, you know, I can't, I, I can't do that. I, I just got to go for it. But maybe I'll, I'll up the volume on, on a little bit of humor or a little bit of um, stupidity. You know, like I think I'm really powerful and then I'll trip as I go out the door or something, <laughs> you know, just to, just to do something that, that undercuts me a little bit. But yeah, yeah I, I've, I've always found that, that it's really important, and especially with kids, you can't dial it down. You, If anything, you dial it up and you allow everybody else to compensate. You, you know, I was thinking about like the movies from my childhood of the 80s. Some of those kids' movies had some scary-ass villains. I mean, the villain in Legend, the uh, the, yeah. uh, the devil-like character, uh, Monster Squad, the guy who played uh, Dracula. I mean, they, they weren't dialing themselves yeah. down, and though they were great movies. Yeah, um, Disney movies have some scary. You know, some of those ones in the sixties and seventies. What's the one with the child catcher in it? It was absolutely terrifying. You remember the way it's a, it's a Disney, it's a live action uh, movie. Is it okay. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? Maybe. Oh, could, yeah. It's, that's, that's it, right. it, it, it's it's one of those back in the sixties. I was scared to death, you know, uh, but loved, but thrilled. You know, there's a kind of a a primal thrill about being scared and about wanting a bit more and about, about um, and, and in some ways, uh, and this is the whole thing about horror, um, there's a reassurance too, is if we're, if we're scared out of our complacency, but we come back to a different place, we're, we're always relieved. You know, it's like detective novels. The world's gone to ratchet. People have been murdered, etc. But we solve the puzzle of why it happened and who did it. And I, I think it's the same with horror. I think horror introduces the possibility of a virus or, or something crazy or, you know, the suburban dream has been turned on its head. But, and then we see things go back to normal and we're kind of thrilled that it, we're, we're back where we were and we appreciate what we have. Yeah. And it's like the, the um, underbelly of, um, uh, of the commercial dream, you know? And, and so I, I, I always like that. I like being part of that. But the, the, it's reassuring too. I, I don't think that horror is out and out um, upsetting people. I don't think people are tr necessarily traumatized by the horror genre. Hmm. Now, the one of the stars in the film is Denise Richards. What, what would she like to work with? She's great. Um, she's a pro, right? I mean, she comes in, you know, she's she's done a lot of these movies. Unlike me, I mean, I, I it's unusual for me to do that style of movie. Denise is everybody's idea of a, an idealized mom. 
right? Mm-hmm. You know, like everybody wants Denise Richards to be her, their mom. And so she's she's played that part a lot. And and she always brings, she always gives each one a little twist. It's not like she comes and just does the same thing every time. But she comes in and she's got it there and she does it. And uh, it's kind of, it's kind of cool to, to work with actors like her um, who are just really confident about who they are and uh, they 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 deliver you know and uh, there's no attitude there's no kind of what well, didn't you know that once upon a time i did this that's or the other this is what she does and she brings it to the table now in, in the sequel to um to return to uh, in return to wickensburg um hexameister is escaping from prison so he obviously spent some yeah. time in jail how has that experience changed him and what is his motivation now yes I, 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 what, what, what's your question? So how has the experience of being in prison changed him? Oh, I see. Um, you're asking a deep psychological question there <laughs> about um, uh, Hex. You see, I, yeah, I, th- I think it's just made him sulk and um, feel even more angry and annoyed. I think that unlike... A, 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 so a portrayal like death for instance where i think that i can afford to go down all kinds of um sort of um more naturalistic conventional psychology uh, roots i think with hexameister i think we he's more um he's, he's just more and more livid and angry so um so I, I yeah, I, I don't think he's particularly chastened or or changed by his time in prison. Is, is his goal just gonna be revenge this time, or is it does he still have similar goals of uh, you know on Wickensburg or is it get back at the people who put him there? I I, I think revenge and um uh power. Just power. Um and, and it points to a sort of an imba- something I think that in there is a very vulnerable man who f- somehow feels inadequate, but uh, wants to impose his power and his prestige and his fancy clothes and his fancy lifestyle on everybody else. And uh, he's like that terrible um, professor that we've all had at school or somewhere, you know, at one point where you're the, the victim of their knowledge and their their arsenal of of things that they've acquired in the world so um return to wickensburg first i can tell has been completed filming do we know when it's gonna be released um soon i you know i don't know i'm uh look out for it i i'm i'm not sure i i i haven't talked to uh richard the director for a while and um look out for it <laughs> oh, do we know if it's gonna be streaming or theaters? Um, streaming, I think. Yeah, I, I think it will be Apple TV. I have a feeling. So, what what, what can we look forward to next from you? Oof, um, what am I doing? Um, I just in the fall I did a really interesting uh, indie film. Um, it's it's called. Uh, working title is Honey Bunch. There was a a movie called Honey Bunch some 20 years ago. So, and it's got nothing to do with this one. So they might have to change the title. I I, I don't know, but it's, what I I think is really cool about it is that it's directed by a husband wife team and it stars um, a husband wife team, a separate, a different husband wife team. They're not, it's not autobiographical or anything, but there's a, but obviously, it's a, there's a couple dynamic in the leads, and there's a couple dynamic in the directors. I, I've never been directed by um, a couple before, and it, and I thought, oh my god, what, how's this going to work? You know, like who do you listen to? Like, like is, right, right, is right, one right. person? Like, it, it's like mum and dad, right? You know, when mum and dad sort of say something, you go, you play mum off against dad, or you play, right. you know, you go, yes, dad. But mum said this or, you know, uh, and so I thought, oh, no, but they were actually really cool. And they both had their uh, areas of specialty, um, one on set and one more behind the monitor. And, and you know, you, you would look to certain direction from one and certain style from the other. And so and, and the crew looked to one and it was really interesting. And within that, 
I really enjoyed seeing how the couple also worked and they played a couple in the movie. So it's well worth looking out for. It's, it's an independent at the working titles, Honey Bunch. It'll, I have a feeling it will do the festival circuit in the fall. The, um, the directors, the, they're a couple. They did a, a really cool uh, movie that was, I believe it was on Netflix called Violation. Uh, it was a horror film, a, like a body horror film. Um, so the directors are Madeline Sims Frewer and Dusty Mancinelli. They're, they're the couple. And then the, um, the, the main couple are um, Grace Glowicki and Ben Petrie. They're, they're the leads. And then I'm in there. Jason Isaacs is in it. Jason Isaacs is a fine uh, British character actor. And Kate Dickey is in it. It's a really cool eclectic mix. And I, I think it's going to be creepy and chilly. It's got a bit of a, it's got a, 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 bit of a um, get out vibe to it where to, a couple are in an institution to be one of them is being fixed after an accident and you're not quite sure why or whether they're going to get fixed or who's around in this institution it's it's just creepy it's creepy in a really interesting way so um yeah that yeah, that was a very long roundabout description of the next project i mean oh my no god worries. um when it's time to um, talk about it, can you come back on the show? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. 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 That'd be absolutely awesome. Mr. Richings, it's been an absolute honor to speak with you, sir. And I mean that 100%. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice talking to you. You as well, sir. Bye now. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Diversity Stars podcast. Please help me battle the algorithms by liking and subscribing. Be sure to return for the next episode when Jeremy Hahn boards the mullet ship. Talk about the future of Spawn. To the next voyage, travel on.